And, uh, welcome to the IMC seminar. We had a cancellation um, last week and um, Erik Fuhl uh, kindly offered to step in at a very short notice to describe some of the work that she has been involved in uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, we had the great pleasure of having Gerrit visiting IMC uh, what now seems like ages ago, uh, so <laughs> spring 2019, before we were hit by, by the whole COVID stuff. And other than being a, a fantastic uh, researcher in cognitive science, Gerrit also has a background as a, as a competitive mountain bike uh, rider. And she proved that by riding her bike all the way back to Tromsø, more or less from Aarhus going back, which I thought was probably the most amazing achievement and what I'm really envious uh, of having done. So Gary, it's, it's great that you join us again for this uh, seminar here. You know the drill, please take us away. Oh, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's perfect timing um, for me. And um, I will present really some uh, data we collected in April and July together with some colleagues. And the topic is then, as you see, identifying resilience factors uh, during the outbreak. And I'm located in uh, Tromsø, the Arctic University, um, but um, this university really has a record of actually being extremely international. Um, we were always remote, so uh, we were quite early on, not only with open science, but also with digitalization. But you may wonder actually um, why am I just one of those many who jumped on uh, COVID uh, or Corona studies. And well, there's some truth to it because I did Corona studies, but it's actually not that far off from my main uh, work, which is being interested in uh, human decision making or more broadly said, I'm really interested in human rationality. And that encompasses simply understanding uh, factors that lead to paranoia. And by more and more being uh, yeah, taking into the um, more clinical psychology aspect that comes also with distress um, and uh, mental health. Um, that's not where I'm coming from. I was more looking at rationality in a comparative aspect, um, but over the years, um, this has actually um, more and more gotten a touch also of clinical psychology, um, particularly um, working with two of my PhD students where we look at how um, psychotic experiences um, that paranoia is one of them um, affect cognitive abilities and also motivation um, how sleep problems and worrying uh, may actually um, precede psychotic symptoms um, or uh, now uh, submitted also looking a bit uh, of that uh, with uh, relapse in a one year experience sampling study. So that's the PhD project from TEAS. And also uh, normally in our lab, um, we're also using their um, yeah, pupillometry, but also heart rate um, measurements and uh, try to uh, see how these uh, effects um, behavior uh, as well in uh, along this uh, continuum of uh, autism and uh, psychosis. Um, but yeah, the lab got closed and I was reading up uh, already, uh, I don't think when I was in Aarhus, but a bit after on the 1918 uh, flu and some other medical history. And I since January uh, this year, monitored this outbreak, uh, having learned how luckily we got from the um, bird flu, so to say. And my supervisor, PhD supervisor, he was really a bit paranoid when it came to pa pandemic, uh, to the <laughs> bird flu, buying um, the medication there. And we had it always in the fridge. So whenever I uh, <laughs> took some food out for the, for the birds, I saw this, oh, okay, got reminded of the bird flu, but it was uh, um, for him, not for our birds we had. Um, so uh, I was already in, in February monitoring um, what was happening in China, also having a colleague there. She's actually in Trondheim, um, but she was just visiting China and then got uh, 
in the lockdown uh, with her four-year-old uh, child. So hands-on experiences and um, um, yeah, Tromsø was the first case in Norway, I uh, think end of February. And so was already playing with thoughts, okay, let's measure um, whether this would change uh, paranoid thinking, even conspiracy theories and so on. And on the day Norway closed down, we were actually sitting together in the lab uh, and uh, created uh, a survey. And these are some of the uh, co-workers um, on for Brazil. I don't know. Can you see now my pointer? Yep. On the top uh, left, uh, Brazil and uh, Natalia Dutra joined us. If I pro mispronounce your name, I'm sorry for that. I'm really bad at names. Then Ricardo uh, Tam Tamayo joined us uh, for also collected data in Colombia. Uh, Niamh Regev collected data in Israel, major job in translating it into Hebrew and Arabic. Um, so I'm also glad for Google because occasionally I had then, um, when I merged the surveys uh, to translate it back. And Martin, um, one of uh, my PhD students uh, and clinical psychologist, uh, will become a clinical psychologist, he's currently in the Practi uh, practical training uh, also contributed uh, a lot to the survey. Um, not shown here is Christopher and another helping hand from Brazil, um, Reinaldo. So together with them, uh, we looked at uh, how the uh, non-pharmacological interventions, the talk you heard last uh, week, uh, actually are perceived and what effect they have on mental health uh, in actually these uh, as a six countries. We also had enough participants uh, from the US because we had an English version. So, um, but we already in the beginning, uh, we're setting it out as a longitudinal study. Um, so you can call it foresight or just luck. Um, but uh, yeah, having just a few months ago read about the um, 1918 flu, I don't want to call it Spanish flu because that's actually wrong here. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I, I knew it, but uh, I kind of was expecting a second wave and uh, yeah, some bits to it. So it was designed as a longitudinal study. Um, and it's a lot inspired by a reasonably old theory, the protection motivation theory. There are different flavors of it, but they all boil down to that you get a fear appraisal and there for some protective behavior, uh, depending on how likely it is it that the threat will happen to you or to the society, how noxious or how severe it will be. So is it extremely deadly uh, or not? Um, but also how um, efficient can you deal with, the, with it? Is there some way to run away as in De Cameroon, you just go um, to uh, yeah, a small village and avoid the big cities or not? And then the add-on by Maddox and Rogers in 1983 was actually to say that it's also uh, important to look at self-efficacy. So can we apply this to um, the current pandemic? Um, there seems to be uh, quite some elements that hold still. So it is uh, about fear appeal communication and to arouse people and thereby persuade. So we know communication or the function of language often is persuasion and definitely the signal of closing um, yeah, kindergarten schools uh, and universities or uh, also anything with education is a clear signal to the uh, citizens, uh, okay, here's something um, that is a threat and uh, please listen to us. Um, what kind of effect uh, do we actually see after a few weeks? Well, the media often has reported, so absolute numbers are not relative numbers. So uh, it got then better over time and 
I've just made it, I looked up yesterday the numbers. So we are roughly 8 billion people on earth. So far, World Omega reports 60 million infected. It's not that much. And the bit, if you put it in relative numbers, is really if you compare it with other causes of death. So cancer is still seven times more, and cancer is just the second uh, most common uh, cause. So there are, um, that's why they also colored here in green, elements that say, okay, the probability is n of you are directly <laughs> um, being affected of it. It's not that high. And it's also, if you're affected, um, you will not immediately die. So that's at an individ individual level. It's still quite a burden for society because our um, health system is uh, not built for this increasing number of patients. And that is not very well communicated. Um, so um, people only now see, okay, a lot of people are not seriously ill and uh, um, I still haven't been infected or not that many have been infected. So that is really a discrepancy here. Will this actually then lead um, to a difference in the efficacy of uh, coping and also the self-efficacy. So that is, I think, uh, the important question here for mental health and also conspiracy theories. So, so do we actually have still primal fear and helplessness? As I argue, that was the original um, response at the beginning of the pandemic. But far more important is to look at um, what you make out of that. Because for most people, the probability and the noxiousness of uh, a corona infection has, um, yeah, has declined. In the beginning, really, we, we have those numbers. Um, it's yeah, over 60% thought they will get uh, uh, infected and that it will be really, really severe. Um, that's not any longer the case. But pandemics are not new. Um, you um, may have also <laughs> heard about previous pandemics, the Black Death, uh, definitely the um, 1918 flu, uh, but there was also 1889 uh, that got the name Russian flu. Um, cholera and uh, well, a lot of uh, unfortunately really more local pandemics happened in uh, uh, North and South America that didn't infect uh, the um, well, the Europeans that in invaded it, but uh, by infecting this. Uh, yeah, I think I don't know the name in, in English now, Pocken. Um, they, well, they more or less uh, killed more half and more of the population, um, indigenous population in uh, North America and South America. And here's just an example from Wikipedia that um, the name of the pandemic is often in uh, among, um, yeah, the people associated with a, a country that you have not the best relationship uh, to. So uh, the uh, uh, 1918 uh, flu, which actually originated in the US, uh, has been named in Brazil the German flu, in, um, yeah, in uh, Poland as a, more or less the Russian disease. Um, and so on. So we see this also in other areas. Um, historically, here for the Black Death, the Jews were the scapegoats and the naming and therefore scapegoating an entire nation. Um, well, I guess you all have been a witness of uh, one politician and how, what he named the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So like I said, these uh, conspiracy theories are also not something new. Um, they have flourished, they are historical evidence, but we forget them. 
it, it's really amazing uh, that they, or it's actually maybe a good thing uh, that we are not any longer knowing about those old uh, conspiracy theories. Um, so that's an example also from the 19th, uh, 19th century, um, where also what would help against it, some like now you just avoid 5G, uh, eat more onions uh, or drink that and that. So the point is really that pandemics, um, in, during pandemics, conspiracy theories uh, blo uh, bloom is, is not new. The question is just how have you learned something from it? Is a higher, um, a more literate society actually more protected on what else would also maybe protect uh, against it? Because these conspiracy theories can be really lethal. So they have led to pogroms. Um, so in the Middle Ages, the Jews have been nearly, yeah, their numbers has been reduced to a, a very small number in Europe um, because they have been the cause for um, the scapegoat for the Black Death. Um, so uh, we definitely don't uh, want this kind of action. Um, so then let's look at what may actually yeah, uh, keep us sane and this still distinguish uh, fact from fake uh, news. Uh, and what is also known and not new is that um, conspiracy theories, not so much, but uh, fact, uh, fake belief in fake news they do also are not good for your mental health put it this there's good uh, connection a relationship between uh, depression and distress uh, and paranoia and it's it's a bit difficult to find their cause and consequence i mean we are looking also at the prodromal phase uh, so uh, it, it's it's both influence each other. So how did we actually look at it? Um, now a few details uh, to our survey. We ask people whether they keep a regular schedule um, that had all the um, scales we are using. And I have to say that is a, a lucky finding, hey, actually very high internal consistency. So uh, a McDonald's Omega, which is a hmm, better, but uh, similar, um, if you're familiar with Kronbach's Alpha, they were actually quite high often about 0.8 or higher. So uh, back to that, we ask about whether people keep a regular schedule. So regarding eating, sleeping, and in general, we ask them about their perceived risk to uh, get infected or becoming seriously ill or actually being an asymptomatic spreader. We also ask them about trust uh, and confidence in authorities, um, their government, uh, healthcare system, but also one about scientists. So kind of scientists will find a cure or a vaccine. Then we created a scale about thriving. Um, so um, belonging to the community uh, and so on with eight items. Uh, a negative mindset, uh, we ask there as well. So thoughts about catastrophizing and uh, the lack of control. Uh, as in our March uh, survey, we ask uh, again about the perceived efficacy of actions. So your own actions like hand washing or keeping social distance, are they uh, effective in uh, combating the outbreak? Uh, that of others and that of the government. Um, we also looked at um, how long people thought the outbreak would last and the durations. So um, the, the, sorry, the, the restrictions. Um, we also had three items that were uh, facts, uh, like the uh, virus originates from uh, uh, animals. And um, we also had clear conspiracy items that it came from a Wuhan uh, laboratory. 
So uh, in addition, we ask people what they actually day, uh, do during a day. Um, so we had uh, a range of items, either home office um, or still going to a workplace, but also whether they would uh, phone or um, yeah, video messaging services uh, use for staying in contact with family and friends, whether they would practice mindfulness or praying, care for kids uh, and do it yourself work. So, so a lot of, of uh, items and they could uh, answer them from um, not doing them at all to doing them more than five hours a day. We use the um, clinical outcomes in routine evaluation questionnaire, approbation is core. Uh, we use the short version, which has 10 items, but uh, we removed the one item uh, asking about suicidal thoughts because we could not offer um, yeah, uh, clinical or uh, therapeutic help and the um, ethical committee recommended them to remove that. Um, so uh, that's why it's only nine items. We uh, used the positive subscale of the community assessment of psychotic experience, a privated CAPE. That is also standard in my lab. We, we run this uh, a lot in also our pupil metry studies. Um, and this normally has 20 items, so we specifically pick 10 items that uh, are on anomalous perception and um, paranoia, so persecutory, persecutory um, ideation. And we also ask about overreaction uh, in the sense of, do you think your country is doing enough for fighting the outbreak? Um, maybe they don't know it, uh, or they are stating it's not doing enough, or um, the opposite is stating um, my country is overreacting. And if they said yes, then we ask whether this would be about personal freedom or the econ economy, um, the price for the economy is too high and so on. So let's give you a flavor. Like I said, we are having a conven convenience sample with uh, 2,600 participants um, that uh, finished enough of it. I think there were over 3,000 who started the survey, but some, um, yeah, we had a bit of attrition in April and very high attrition rate in July. So in July, we only have uh, around 800 participants. Um, this is actually longitudinal. So extremely many participants, um, yeah, could not be a hedgehog to answer it in July. Uh, it's not the case that you can explain it with uh, summer vacation. I think it had more to do that it became more the new normal, uh, the pandemic and people were less interested in contributing uh, or also others were flooding it with um, surveys. Um, what is interesting here is that um, in April, um, people in South America were more or less in quarantine. This was not so much the case in Norway and Germany. So um, the experience there is quite different, but as we will uh, see, this may not actually have the biggest impact. Um, very few actually had, uh, or at the time when we ask, uh, have uh, an infection. I know a few um, that answered from Germany who had it. Um, one of them actually also wrote a piece in the uh, Financial Times. He just got diagnosed when he was on the way to South Korea um, because his mother is South Korean. So it was a very interesting uh, piece. Um, um, and quite a proportion um, were actually essential workers in Germany, Israel, and Norway. And I think that actually has a bit of an effect on our data. So now let's first look at a bit what people are doing. Um, I will now uh, flood you with a lot of um, figures, um, but I come back to what I think this, uh, or how you can interpret it. So first, comparing really a bit the South Americans, uh, so Brazil and Colombia are very similar. I'm just showing here you one of them. Um, they spend a lot of their time in home office. So you can already see that this is presumably not a poor uh, sample. So we had at least um, 
middle class uh, in Brazil and in Colombia. In Colombia particularly, it was uh, many students. Um, so home office also meant universities are closed. I'm studying from home. And uh, what you also can see um, that, uh, sorry, I have to go in here. Um, so the, the white one means this doesn't apply for them. So there's not that many who have to care for kids. Um, but the majority of the day is spending working from home. Um, they do a bit of exercising um, and helping and also watching the news. Some people excessively. Uh, that's the percentage of people who watch more than five hours a day the news. So maybe it's that. Can, you can compare that to um, Norway. Uh, and the um, uh, pattern is very similar in Germany and Israel. Where still um, the majority seems to be able to go to the office. So it's, that was actually a bit surprising for me. Um, particularly in Norway, so there was a big call of home office. And with the digitalization, it was actually easy peasy, so to say. But it seems to be that um, it was still in way, at least in April, uh, then uh, for many to go to the office. That was actually what I knew already was the case in, in Germany. They never uh, had any um, uh, stopping there. Um, it was just some companies that closed, um, but it was not so that the, the state uh, ordered uh, home office. Um, here you have a slightly higher proportion of people that also care uh, for children. So that is roughly the pattern. Now let's look at the, uh, at the I think more informative bit, namely would those activities also what you're doing uh, during the lockdown, uh, how would that affect your um, distress or your mental health? So the distress again is measured with the core, this um, nine items. And we actually see that if you ticked off that you do a lot of procrastination, so um, two hours or more a day, that this was actually positively associated with more distress. What is also surprising um, is if you engaged more in phoning and messaging uh, with friends and family. So the more you do this on a day, on a usual day, the more, the higher was also your distress. It may have to do that you, <laughs> that is speculation. We have no uh, post hoc questions on that, uh, that you actually may uh, get also from other people their worries, uh, which again may increase your own worry. Um, you may run out of always telling, no, everything will be uh, okay. And as we say here in Norway, alt blir bra. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, what is positive, so that is also not quite consistent across countries. You may have trouble seeing this, the numbers might be too small, I apologize. But for Germany and Israel, there's actually no uh, association. It's driven by Norway and Colombia. So we'll come back. This is data for April. It is beneficial for your mental health if you, do, if you go out um, and if you exercise that you can maybe also do in, uh, in your living room. So that is consistent across countries, though Israel uh, more or less has a null. Uh, maybe it's not very common in this country. Uh, I think they couldn't go out at the time in April. Uh, so Neve, correct me, but I think in April there was still um, quite some restrictions. Yeah, that's right. We, the time we ran the survey, there were was still a general lockdown. Was the kind of the fun yeah, day. yeah. So whereas Germany, Norway were always allowed still to go out, maybe just within your small area, but it was not so that you could not go or were restricted to just hundred meters or so. Um, yes, and the Norwegians still kept on doing exercises. Uh, still remembered with some some friends, we 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 had that in our living room, and the gyms were closed, and we just tried to push us. It's not quite the same, but at least they did something. Um, but we could go skiing, so it's okay. Well, how does it look in July? Um, 
there the major uh, effect, um, maybe you see this if I just do this, look at this bit here, um, the procrastination actually has increased. So more people say they actually procrastinate and it's still not beneficial. So uh, the more you do that, um, the higher was also your uh, score on the on general distress. Uh, and it actually, um, apart from Brazil, where the keeping in touch with friends and family by phoning them actually had a negative, as a, it was better for your mental health, in all the other countries, um, it was actually so that if you did it, uh, phoning, messaging with friends and family, the more you did it, the, well, the higher was your mental, uh, your general distress score. Uh, what also replicated uh, or stayed the same in July was then uh, again physical health, uh, yeah, physical activity, either going outside if it's just walking or going to the grocery store, I mean, you're going out, you're getting fresh air or in the other way, even if you cannot do it outside, but you are uh, doing something uh, for raising uh, your blood pressure, so to say in a positive way, doing some exercising, this was positively associated. So what had no effect, and that's why you so see no circles here, is if you practice mindfulness or praying, or if you're watching uh, TV, uh, watching films or so, that is all this, or playing all the slasher. So it seems to be you have to do, to be active or getting fresh air. So that is um, in the uh, variable here, physical. Um, doing, yeah, saying that you're more or less doing nothing um, or procrastinate, avoiding things that you actually have to do um, is not beneficial. That is. That is not new per se, um, but I was surprised that so many people then also say they would do that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, still extremely many indicated that they would still work or, or study. So uh, quite high proportion who still have too, too much time, as you can see here, more than two to three hours a day engaging in procrastination. So there seems to be a, knock-on effect. But the most puzzling thing, uh, we have to look a bit more uh, into it, um, splitting it uh, maybe by how people are affected, is on the social bit. You may first think uh, providing social support is, is beneficial, but maybe uh, in this case it was too much. Uh, this is at the moment speculation, so uh, shoot in uh, in a bit what your thoughts are on that. Now, uh, we have created all those uh, scales on regular schedule, uh, trust in authorities, um, but also, of course, we also measured education, also financial worry, and uh, this negative mindset and perceived risk. And we wanted to see how those actually relate to your general distress score, which we measured with the core nine. And, uh, one of those items or one of the scales we are using was asking how much you belong to your community, also the thriving. And what we are finding uh, across the five countries is uh, then uh, keeping a regular schedule um, definitely is beneficial for uh, your mental health, but also thriving, really feeling being a part of uh, the community. Um, what has not that much uh, effect on mental, uh, also yeah, general distress, mental health, um, is how much you uh, believe uh, or confident and trust uh, your government. Also, the overreaction that was quite uh, interesting is is not um, a strong predictor if at all um, of uh, distress. Also not education, so it's not so clear cut, um, but I will come back to that. Of course, it's not healthy um, if you worry also financially, not only about um, uh, yeah, getting, getting uh, infected, uh, also general worry, catastrophizing thoughts um, go uh, with uh, distress. 
but your perceived risk and how efficient you think the actions are, either your own or that of the government, actually are not um, playing not a big role in uh, your distress uh, feelings. So we can, of course, split it into those who are affected by having really governmentally issued, uh, having a governmentally issued quarantine, those who decide on their own to uh, engage in quarantine, and those who cannot choose because they are defined as essential workers. And there's not that much uh, difference, uh, even for the only difference is a bit in the regular schedule. It matters less for those who are essential workers because for them, there isn't that much of a change. But those who keep a regular schedule despite being in quarantine, it has a slightly more protective uh, effect uh, for mental health. Now, let's look at the change uh, from April to July. And that's where we used all data. So not split by country and not split by how you're affected. So this is a rarely a uh, course uh, um, plotting now. And there we are actually, sorry, the scale, the y-axis is now flipped. Um, that's a weird effect of, of R. I used the same code. Um, uh, we are finding that uh, perceived efficacy, which we find in March was quite um, predictive of your general um, well-being, is actually not having um, and playing a major role. Overall, uh, if you have higher perceived risk of getting infected, yes, then it also goes positively with uh, higher mental uh, general distress. More so if you have a, ne a negative mindset, so catastrophizing thoughts, and also, of course, financial uh, worries. Overall, in the sample, higher education is protective, but it's comparatively small, the effect, if you think of a regular schedule. So those people who really keep a regular schedule, that definitely uh, is beneficial for mental health, but also thriving. And there are only minor changes. Um, from uh, April to July. Like I said, the sample in July, you also see this here on the distributions is smaller, so the uh, confidence uh, is uh, lower than the data. But what you also see is that the uh, uh, trust uh, overall, if you look at uh, it across countries and how people are affected, is beneficial. So uh, higher trust in the government and in scientists and the um, health um, authorities is also uh, protective. Now, I mentioned trust, um, and uh, that is actually something that uh, we saw also in March may have an effect on um, para paranoia. So because uh, it is linked to talking to the right people and thereby calibrating your thoughts. Uh, instead of spreading false uh, information, um, you may talk to the, or receive the information that, oh no, this is bullshit. Um, so yes, we have looked actually at bullshit receptivity as well. So let's look at this, uh, the effect of trust uh, on paranoia. And the first finding is, uh, not surprising, it's a replication of many studies, uh, including our own. Uh, if you feel more distressed, you also um, score higher on uh, the paranoia uh, subscales that we used. So uh, that is here the core nine, and it's consistent in all five countries that we look at. None of the other predictors are actually significant. However, we can again look at how you are affected uh, and we see that uh, if we split it in uh, those who have uh, been in quarantine or those who are essential workers, um, then we actually see some effect of keeping a regular schedule uh, and trust. So uh, it seems that there are um, yeah, some benefits of it still. Uh, and that may have to do, you see this here, that uh, there's 
an interaction, presumably. I have only used them the, the linear um, and have not used interaction terms in the regression analysis, but between uh, trust and distress or, and also thriving. I compensate for that in, a, in another analysis. So let's look about this uh, from uh, April and July, again, over all five countries and irrespective of how we have been affected. Um, there we uh, see that, uh, again, uh, distress is, um, yeah, positively, as a more distress um, is positively associated also with more paranoia. Uh, but we also see an interesting finding when it comes to trust, so higher trust uh, in governments uh, and scientists actually protective for paranoia. So, um, and that stays also from April to July. It only gets a bit weaker, but so also gets the influence of distress weaker. So let me sum this up. So we see that the perceived risk, um, we really ask people, do they think they get infected? Um, do they think a family member will need hospitalization or they are becoming asymptomatic spreaders or infecting many others? Um, and the scale had really high uh, reliability, but it, it, this perceived risk uh, does not play a big role for uh, your um, mental well-being and paranoia. And also the perceived efficacy of these non-pharmacological interventions, um, also the, the restrictions and the actions seem also not to play a big role for distress and paranoia a bit into the pandemic, not really at the start of the pandemic as it was in March, but really now when it's one and four months old for most uh, participants. Um, the general distress though is lower um, if uh, you maintain a regular schedule and you really feel you belong to the community. So people who have a, a good social uh, network, it does need to be a big social network. That is, that is not really what is behind it. It's just that you feel being part of something. Um, and uh, kind of reflecting some other studies, but really interesting how um, clear it is also in our data that if you have less trust in authorities, you have more paranoid thoughts. I make make a big break here before I go to part two, because I saw there were quite some uh, questions, it seems. Maybe I can take some of them. Um, there seems to be smallpox. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm... Um, okay. Uh, so um, yeah. yeah. Just yes. Very quickly. I'm sure you said um, how you measured paranoia. Um, yes. But I, I, I missed you it. You missed it. Uh, I, I'm presumably I talked too quickly. I used uh, 10 items of uh, the uh, positive uh, CAPE. As a, the CAPE is the Community Assessment for Psychotic Experiences. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a standard instrument that has reasonably high correlation also with the PANS, which is the clinical instrument. Yeah. And there are all published cutoff points. Um, and the, there are, it depends, there are two papers out on, on subscales of the positive scale. Mm -hmm. um, so there is the anomalous perception subscale, then the persecutory uh, ideation uh, subscale, but then mm -hmm. there's um, also grandiosity. Mm -hmm. I think we use two items from the grandiosity as well. So how uh, you... And then there are also hallucinations, and I don't, I don't think we use the item here, hearing voice, but I have to double check because I know Tease is using this item. So I'm okay. currently, yeah. How did you select the items? Uh, yes. Um, we have run in another master project uh, these 10 items um, and we selected them based on a paper that um, 
came up with the subscales of the positive uh, items. There's a reasonably good agreement that out of those 20 items, only 18 are really measuring positive experiences. And I would need to, I can send you the reference. I would need to look it up, but we choose the three uh, scales that we think is most paranoia uh, related and not about yeah, just seeing mice because okay. we have not so good experience with that item because um, I mean, I myself worked with mice. So, <laughs> uh, so we actually ex excluded um, two of the subscales. Uh, but I would need to check it. But we had run this in a previous master project and uh, also here now the the items, I mean, that the scale was, was at high internal consistency, but ecological validity, yeah, we have not run this past uh, this uh, clinical subset. We okay. could presumably reanalyze um, some data that we have from patients um, using the CAPE uh, and see uh, whether the subscale actually is, uh, has a better correlation with the puns. Fair point. Um, yeah, no, we okay. don't. Have that. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> if I can add just yes. here, it, it's um, super interesting this last point about paranoia, um, if not full blown psychotic experiences and the lack of trust in authorities, particularly because a lot of the um, kind of conspiracy stuff seems to be inserting itself, you know, directly in that relation, right? So I guess, do you have any way in your data to explore something like QAnon or other kind of sources of conspiracy? You know, are they somehow mediating this link or are people yeah. able to do it? Or is this just outside of your domain or your data domain to say anything about that? With respect to QAnon, it's outside because we did not use this conspiracy theory. Um, but I have met already yesterday a note that for some of this, I would need to, uh, uh, or I would like to do a mediation analysis, particularly between the link of trust and paranoia and how much watching the news um, actually uh, as a, would mediate that. Because I think it can be not very healthy if you watch too many news and they um, presumably end up in watching the wrong news. As a, um, but we are not having uh, specifically asked for a range of conspiracy theories. We kept this rather concise. I have a colleague, they actually looked at, Janis Zickfeld, they actually looked about this closer, but it was also March data. And I think uh, QAnon was not there really that popular, maybe not even on there. At, in March, we know about the 5G uh, conspiracy theory um, and that the virus was well a product of a uh, Wuhan lab. Um, it came a few weeks later, uh, at least in, in, in Europe, uh, the information of QAnon. So we don't have that particularly in it. But we have, um, uh, I, I come actually back to that. We, we have some some more links between the, the scales. And I think that is that might be informative. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I understand the 5G and uh, the Wuhan <laughs> lab, but uh, what exactly is the content of the um, QAnon um, conspiracy? I think rather than it being a conspiracy, it's kind of a whole cluster of ways to set people out on a search to figure the real meaning by, behind all the events that are currently happening, including the COVID-19. I'll just uh, throw a link in here. So okay. it was just a placeholder for that kind of general drive towards saying something is at stake that involves the authorities and that really gets you into an incredibly creepy kind of world to be in, right? So okay. it would be very interesting yeah. to see if some of these conspiracy theories could be mediating this particular link. Yeah, and I think based on our data, we would not expect that news in itself would be doing something like this. Um, Christopher is doing some very interesting work on the news yeah. content that seems to suggest that, you know, the, the basic function of the kind of ordinary media disappears during the COVID-19 crisis in the sense they don't produce news that stick any longer. 
But yeah. we wouldn't see it as relating to, to news consumption as such, but that, this is something to explore further later. But yeah, I'll we, leave you we, to the rest of your talk and then we we'll, can discuss it later. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I haven't looked uh, uh, at that. I, I'm just um, thinking also, um, I mean, the trust, we can definitely look closer into it, uh, the difference between scientists and, and government and yeah. also health authorities. Even if they have uh, the scale high internal consistency, sometimes um, you you may want to specifically look at just one of those items. Be particularly, we measure also confidence in dealing with the situation and believe they can, they do their best, so to say, and, and trust. And it's not quite the same. So even if people on average are scoring their alike um, as a consistent, it, it's still a bit different um, whether you ask for trust or um, confidence. Anyway, let we also ask them how long they think the um, uh, pandemic will last and the restrictions. And there are some interesting cultural differences, I just leave it at that. Um, and uh, overall the Europeans are a bit pessimistic and the South Americans are a bit more pessimist, uh, optimistic, sorry. So we really ask them, okay, will the um, pandemic just last a few weeks, a few months, or actually forever? And the Germans and Norwegians, they thought it will last forever. It may have a bit, it's pure speculation from my side to do with interpreting it. Um, I mean, the flu is also something that is kind of forever. Um, so, and if you're highly literate, you got the information that the coronavirus belongs to a family of viruses. So with that respect, it may not be so wrong to answer it's forever. Um, but as we formulated it, um, yeah, in, in terms of the pandemic per se, then uh, pandemic shouldn't last forever. I think uh, we agree on that bit. Now, what about um, regarding the restrictions? And that's actually also a bit interesting. Uh, we have again, really pessimistic Germans, so <laughs> uh, German angst. Um, so uh, compared to uh, yeah, Brazil and Israel that are far more optimistic that the restrictions actually, uh, and then we're talking about April here, uh, will end. And uh, the irony is that Norway and Germany, there they ended actually, whereas in Brazil, uh, not really. Um, I can't really know it. I think also Israel over the summer was a bit uh, uh, less restrictive. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 maybe that's just a an, an, an general attitude, but we definitely use the term forever and that quite a proportion and we have to see how that affects actually trust and uh, um, yeah, well-being. I haven't split it by that at all because we didn't pre-register uh, uh, this uh, as, a, as a predictor uh, in anything, we just measured it. So uh, yeah, quite of interesting, um, definitely something uh, worth maybe to dive deeper. Anyway, I started with uh, linking it to the protection motivation theory and said, um, apart from assessing the probability and the noxiousness of the threat, um, what really helps uh, for dealing with, um, yeah, disasters and pandemics is also um, how efficient um, you can cope with it, both as a society and uh, yourself. And I'm now really a bit bold and say, Nah, that's not quite explaining it. So maybe what's actually going on, we, we can really look what is the common pattern of our scales we are using. And I'm quite aware we did not measure everything that's possible to measure. And this is a really overloaded figure and something I definitely should not do. Um, I'm quite aware of it, but I think uh, this is a network analysis. Uh, the overall structure you see is quite similar, but there are two important differences between countries. And uh, that has to do on the one hand, how strongly the connection is actually between perceived risk uh, and trust, which is really strong 
in the case of Norway, but there's nothing going on in Brazil, Colombia, very weakly actually uh, in Germany and in Israel. So the colors also stand for something for those who are not familiar with these uh, network analyses. So if it's actually uh, blue, then it's positive, blue kind of in trust. That's why most bank uh, banks have also blue in their uh, logos. So uh, the more paranoid you are, uh, the more distressed and vice versa, uh, whereas um, the, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong one here. The more um, paranoid you are, that's the number one in all those bits, uh, the more distress you have. It's not, it's a weak correlation uh, in Germany and Norway and Israel, but quite strong in Brazil and Colombia. A regular schedule has a positive meaning in this sense, a negative correlation. If you're more keeping a more regular schedule, then you're having less distress. So there's quite a, a pattern here. It's not so much the case actually in Israel. But what I would more draw your attention to is that um, the uh, seven stands for thriving. So that is quite central and connected to many other um, scales that we are used, have used. So uh, thriving is, um, so the more you thrive, the less distress you have, the more you thrive, um, the strangely enough also to some extent, uh, the more negative uh, mindset you have, uh, but also the more you thrive, the more trust you actually have. So those go together, but also, um, more thriving means you also see higher efficacy, perceived efficacy. And this pattern is that the seven, the thriving is reasonably, is quite a, quite a hub together with a negative mindset, which is the number four. Whereas your paranoid thoughts and your risk, this is the number six here, these are not central um, for uh, all the scales we are measured. So there are, uh, it's more important uh, the thriving and the trust and the negative mindset. Uh, they are uh, always central in, in all those uh, plots um, across countries with some uh, nuances, um, as you can, can see here, in, and how uh, much they link to risk. Uh, and what do I then think? What do I make of this? So I've changed this here instead of efficacy of coping. I would say it has a lot to do with the trust in authorities. And instead of self-efficacy, I think maybe we want to replace it by thriving or being part of a community because pandemics is not something you alone can uh, deal with. So uh, that is a large chunk, but definitely not everything of the data from April and July. And I would like uh, to thank for your attention and uh, taking now lots of questions and comments, what else you think we could look into it um, to uh, yeah, present the data for, for a few more. It will be open data or parts of it all, I don't, they're already open. So other researchers can dive into it. Thanks. <laughs> oh. Questions and comments are open. You can just uh, raise your hand on the screen or however you want to do it. So would it be fair to say um, that the best way to deal with um, everything unleashed by the pandemic would be to give people a way to thrive because yeah. as soon as they thrive, um, the, the rest of the problems go away. I would, would agree on that in the sense of if you give them a task to do um, so that they are not procrastinating, that it, it's kind of they have a purpose, a purpose in life. Uh, and that's uh, also for, for not only a mundane thing to do, like caring for kids or so, but something that they think, okay, I, somebody else or the community as such would benefit. You may then wonder or argue, well, you're not seeing this in helping being protective against the distress. Um, 
that may have to do with how general helping may be understood uh, in how we phrased it. The helping could be really just, a, yeah, helping people to move or so. So I think this, this thriving is more about um, what is this long term, this reciprocal um, helping uh, in, includes that at least and, and seeing a uh, yeah, meaning in life, I would say, is, is included in, in the thriving. And I think if you have start kind of with negative thoughts, uh, like we see here with this catastrophizing, um, it, it needs a lot of effort from your friends and family to get you out of that. So, no, I, I would agree with you that uh, fostering, thriving, uh, community building, giving people a higher sense and giving them some tasks to do. Um, yeah, I, it, it's not really new per se, but definitely something uh, the uh, government and co should, should encourage. And that is why um, it's more anecdotal now, but many people are, um, that are affected by uh, the lockdowns, um, restaurants and tourism and also artists, particularly artists, uh, musicians and so on, um, theater and so on, they, they don't understand it any longer because they say there is no risk and it, we, we need that. People need this uh, entertainment, but also they themselves need it because suddenly they're, well, they, they're not any longer feeling to belong uh, even because they are not valued by the state. They are not, um, yeah, they are not relevant. Art is not relevant. Um, and uh, that was definitely an outcry uh, in the German media. And uh, uh, you can question that if you look at what is left over from prehistoric times, it's art. <laughs> A bit of tools as well, but it's art. So we are a species that definitely, um, yeah, needs that as well. So yeah, I, I think thriving. Um, yeah, I'm. I I haven't expected it as such, but um, on on hindsight, it makes sense. I would say yes. Yeah, and I think this is deeply interesting because you can say. Um, if, if it's about regularity and thriving, right, then yeah. the kind of most widespread uh, close down seems to be destroying precisely that, right? Exactly. And the whole idea about social distancing rather than physical distancing is destroying precisely that. You're basically, you know, locking people up in their homes with nothing to do and all the ordinary schedules taken away from it. Yeah. So I think that's is, you know, it's a very important message to get out there to say, no. well, there, there are ways that you can you know, physically keep distance from each other without necessarily breaking down your regularity or your rhythms, right? Or that you yes. can re-establish them in other ways. Or there are ways to keep that you are part of something even though you keep the physical distance. But that's not what has been highlighted. Oh, thank you so much. Because I, we have um, a draft of an opinion paper on exactly that. And I discussed this uh, also with some, some colleagues uh, and family and there is a second part to it. And that is in the beginning, it was thought that this pandemic is really a life changing event and um, a really big issue for, for society. And um, I, I have to say, um, I'm East German and the, the, the fall of the wall has affected the life of uh, 60 million people and a few more. I mean, it then also collapsed in Czechia and Poland and um, many other countries. And that meant suddenly what you have often worked for, your company, it wasn't any longer. So your life was worthless. So, and um, now making these claims that this, this pandemic is, is very, extremely drastic and life-changing, um, there are quite some people in uh, those countries who went through this and remember uh, how much really your entire life changed within a short time. I mean, it's really, you, you, that would happen maybe in a few years to North Korea <laughs> if, they, if they unite with South Korea. So this perspective uh, on top of this, that you can, uh, if you take away uh, this, who you are, and there's this thriving because you redefine us a lot of about um, yeah, what kind of work we are doing. 
this we noticed from those studies uh, in the 1990s with people who were affected by the uh, fall of the wall um, that that is really detrimental that kills literally kills people because you have to find yourself as being this and this person and now you're not any longer that so Norway and to a large extent also Germany and I can't speak for the other three countries um, they have a large social net so even if you're you may get unemployed but you're not immediately uh, bankrupt but it cannot compensate for this you suddenly don't know who I mean how do you define yourself you have a, quite also a second part in the, the last 20 years where you not only define yourself through work but also through your other activities whether you're good in some kind of sports or music on the side we have colleagues that also play in bands and so on but also there i have colleagues that also had to stop so a lot of what defines us as humans i mean we're social animals that suddenly got forbidden and put a negative stamp on it and and i think that is where those people not necessarily say that they are overreacting, but they have a hard time to um, to do uh, all what they should do because some of this is just not making sense to them. You, there is no danger. You are allowed to go into a grocery store, but you're not allowed to sitting with a large distance in a, in a theater. Um, so a lot of things I, I yeah, I think they haven't quite found the balance and that's why we also call for yeah just put the measure it um, or give us the data what really worked on on those com compared to as a cost benefit and yeah it's it's it reminds me a lot of what uh, I've learned in in school with the Romans uh, it's called bread and games Brot und Spiele so uh, to maintain uh, or avoid revolutions, uh, the food had to be cheap and you had to give the people some entertainment. So uh, the Romans entertainment was also not so nice maybe, but nowadays, what was the first thing they did? Well, football. <laughs> and they had even in the news, yeah, yeah, there's no, no worries. There will always be enough food. So, but is it really enough to just uh, have the football uh, going? Um, and not the uh, theaters um, and all the other bits for entertainment. I mean, I, I think a lot of entertainment outside of football um, is completely compliant with uh, safety as well with uh, uh, no risk for getting infected. So, uh, yeah. Just to Long follow story. up on this, because um... So Charlotte, who is, is in the screen here, she has been doing ethnographic field work in schools. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like, you know, one of the successes in the schools were that they were extremely fast at constantly kind of setting up new schemes of regularity and coming yeah. up with, you know, each time there was a new regulation saying, now this is a framework within which we can act, right? And, and that seems, you can comment on it, Charlotte, that there is something about that ability to say here is the situation you're given some freedom to come up with a way to create regularity that has been key to what has been going on in schools but i don't know you want to add something to that i think it's important to stress that this freedom to somehow moderate these guidelines yourself has been really important for the schools in order to actually make everything work and mm -hmm. cope with the situation in general but the fact that you had this freedom was also very frustrating because it gave you a lot of responsibility to make the right choice and there was no like right choice. It was something that you would have to find out along the way and you would have to continuously readapt the situation when you found out, oh no, now something doesn't work. We have to reinvent the whole thing. So it was, I think it was mixed feelings. It was both frustration, but it was also uh, appreciating the freedom to guide, to somehow adapt it yourself, yeah. Oh, thanks. So that's, that's very interesting and actually fits also with my personal experience. I mean, there are two issues to it. Um, one is um, the the more stable you are, the more you can also deal with uncertainty and therefore responsibility and do your own, make your own decisions. But if you're already in a weak position because there are too many things happening, you would like that others make decisions for you. So that's also a common pattern in, in, in uh, 
yeah, uh, human decision making or clinical um, experience. And the other one is, I mean, we know how, and but that's an interesting cultural thing. I mean, there. I've read about one culture where they're actually a bit uh, less uh, restrictive there, but mostly it's so that you, the recommendation is to raise a child with giving them clear uh, structure of the day. So, uh, I mean, it boils down to the same here. You, you can then predict, I mean, <laughs> and that's not only what uh, clocks us in uh, surfing uncertainty. Our brain uh, is a machinery of just, uh, yeah, predicting. Uh, and uh, the regularity is simply uh, reduces some of this workload um, because, yeah, it's not something you permanently have to predict. It's just something you, you know will happen. So you can focus on other uh, items or things uh, during the day and, and handle with it. But if you already have a chaotic day and, and you don't know when food or whatever will happen, then it just takes resources away from that. So you can actually help your mental health by um, yeah reducing simply the, the load uh, of what you have to predict and therefore deal with during the day. So following up on this, uh, a colleague of Solare has been doing field work among um, patients with ADHD or people who have a diagnosis with ADHD. And a lot of clinicians feared, you know, that they would see their world breaking down <laughs> under these regulations. And it turns out that a surprising amount of them really seems to be thriving in this yeah. kind of different system. And many of them who used to, or the clinicians used to think that they needed to structure the day in Incredibly regularly in order for them to fit into the world, that they do certainly suddenly quite well using their own schemas and their own principles of organization. So it's almost as if these schemes were needed for them in order to fit into a world that was extremely fast moving, and the slower pace in itself seems to do an awful lot of good to them. Oh yeah, there are other um, anecdotal evidence that uh, certain people with social anxiety and also autism they thrive. Yeah. As an autism, not all, uh, but the majority of them thrive because they, they, they like uh, this kind of, of uh, physical distance uh, and uh, communicating via written uh, or not so many facial expressions um, is often beneficial for them because it's just a sensory overload uh, and they have a different style of communicating and uh, yeah, they, they enjoy, uh, not all of them, but for most of them and also anxiety, definitely. There are schools who say um, that some of the more lonely wolves, uh, they actually now do fact, uh, indeed better because for them, it's, they needed a lot of resources just for being a little bit social and not too awkward. Um, they're not necessarily having a clinical diagnosis, it's just their style. But the majority, and that's also something we are soon starting at, we just had a bit of issue with uh, some data protection uh, agency that uh, ideally wanted us not to ask about the age. Um, we are uh, rolling out the self-help uh, app um, because we know extremely many students or young people suffer under this forced isolation because in their uh, stage of life, um, they, they are even more social uh, and needed. I mean, as I said also here to some colleagues, how did you find your partner for life? I mean, it's definitely not by sitting in your office and having Zoom meetings. So for them, it is this social going out and random uh, bumping into other people and figuring out whether you are on the same wavelength. And um, we have uh, quite an increase of uh, mental health problems in, in yeah, students. Um, <clears throat> They're already dealing with a lot of anxiety and, and a stressful a transition in life, as we call it, transition in life. And then on top coming this, uh, yeah. I mean, the youth aspect is very interesting. Um, certainly in a Danish context, I guess a little bit less in the German, in the Norwegian context, the youth keeps being scapegoated for being, you know, the main kind of vexers for the disease right now. But I think you could make another argument to say that they're really the ones that are affected the most in terms of restrictions to their life at a very kind of um, at a time where it's, it's very sensitive. And at the same time, they are the people who are least likely to be serious, seriously affected by it. So, you know, they could be seen as those who carry the highest load for the 
lowest benefit, yeah. but that's not how they're seen and treated at all. And I think it's absolutely, you know. Yes, we tragic. have, sorry mm -hmm. that I interrupted. Thank I have to know. say we had uh, three weeks ago an outbreak on schools in Tromsø and the community and all those teenagers I mean, that, that was amazing. We had, it stopped immediately. I mean, really, there was no further spread. You, so, and it wasn't also in the news and even the national, um, as a Nackstadt, it's is the name, he even congratulated. And at, he gave a clear signal, we are really impressed how you dealt with it. And you also have to give this positive feedback. You cannot permanently, as a really, yeah say bad things or, or or complain about them no you also i mean it's just um simple psychology really you have also to thank the people and say okay yeah please carry on like that i mean like the british too <laughs> so uh carry on um and that's what they used in the in the, in the, in the war but it, it's it's really uh some media, one has to question. I mean, one thing of the media is why are they uh, reporting and spending, producing so many pages uh, about conspiracy theories that most people are just getting interested in looking them up and getting soaked into it. And the other one is um, our urge or our, I don't know, desire for negative uh, news because then we may feel better because it hasn't affected us. but. I think in a in a crisis or pandemic, we also should uh, form more uh, report also the the achievements and the positive uh, ones. Of course, in a in a balanced way, you cannot say it's over or um, um, yeah, it will not harm you. But permanently to saying everything yeah will become uh, or that the end is near definitely is not very helpful for people then. Um, uh, yeah, maintaining the the social distancing because they think anyway the the world is near, and you see you you start hearing this more and more. Okay, I, I've done it now so long. I'm I'm I can't any longer. It doesn't. There's no effect of it. So um, um, yeah, I mean the the numbers from 80 percent have now dropped to 60 percent in Germany supporting the restrictions, and that's worrisome. Because then we are in a third wave, and um, that I mean, you see this just now in other countries. It's it's, it's not looking good, <laughs> and I'm definitely not a pessimist when it comes to uh, the to Corona. Um, yeah, I think communication. I mean, that's that's also what we have another article is uh, is the key here, and. Uh, I think New Zealand, there was an article showing that New Zealand was one of the few countries that also reported the uncertainty. So they clearly and transparently said, that's what we know and that's what we don't know, we are working on it. Instead of simplifying it, what they did, for example, in Great Britain and making just statements and then they had to correct the statements, but then you kind of treat your citizens as if they are stupid. Yeah. So I think the New Zealand approach was being informed uh, telling it in a simple but as scientifically accurate as possible way and also admitting okay there are things we don't know that may change our advice on what should be done will cha can change because we don't know about it you see signal them it's important we are working on it um and be prepared for updates but saying okay schools are closed because that helps and then no no schools have to be open uh, you confuse people and then they they yeah they are losing their trust and that is, um, we are not the only one. Uh, you also have this in the HOPE project. If trust goes down, um, well, the short answer is good night. And on that note, so just the latest update from the HOPE project is we saw the trust fall dramatically in Denmark after the COVID crisis, not the generalized trust, yeah. but the trust in the kind of the political strategy behind yeah. the health initiatives. And very surprisingly, during the last week, we just saw the numbers bounce back up again. <laughs> So, you know, it seems like in Denmark, you cannot destroy the trust, even though the politicians have really, really tried hard to do it. It keeps <laughs> bouncing back again. So we're scratching our heads to make sense of that. Well, maybe, it, it, 
might be the good news of the vaccines yes. uh, and that they bought in advance uh, some conting contingents uh, on it. Uh, so they thought, oh, okay, maybe that was, but I mean, it's interesting, these fluctuations, because in other projects, we also looked at these fluctuations. Now it's really patient data and these fluctuations, um, they are, seem not to be so predictive uh, of psychotic uh, ones. It's more this, yeah, other, uh, more logical, uh, not logical, that's the wrong word here, but like, like we have sleep. It's really long-term a uh, good predictor of psychotic uh, experience, but not so much these fluctuations in, in, yeah, in, in worry and a few other items you would first predict. So we, we have this over uh, the, the dailies, weekly, and then the more monthly. And, and it, it's quite interesting. And so I wouldn't give much of a, yeah, a change from one week to the other. As you said, it, it will bounce back. Um, so, but if it's a, it's a continuous trend over, over months, then as they collect uh, in the German uh, newspapers, and I also know it has a little bit reduced, also the number of people who want to vaccinate themselves uh, goes down. As in the beginning, nearly everybody wanted to get it. I think if those trends uh, are stable, then I would worry. But um, yeah, a week, I'm not sure. Okay, so thanks again, Gerrit. And let's keep in touch about this here because you know there are so many parallel tracks worth exploring here. Uh, next Tuesday, we're on to something completely different. It's about analog role-playing games, how to study them in different methods. A talk by Sarah Lynn Bauman, and as usual, it's 11 o'clock in this very room here. Uh, so until then, you know, take care and uh, be safe, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs>